Faith is a powerful emotion. In the Bible, there are many tests of faith where someone must prove their loyalty to God. But what happens when faith is used to take advantage of someone? To prove their loyalty, not to God, but to an ordinary man. In this story, a cult leader exploits a young woman's passionate faith. The young woman is just starting college, ready to enter adulthood, when she joins a new church on campus. She soon discovers the church is less focused on God and more focused on its spiritual leader. And in this church, the test of faith revolves around sex. June 1982. I was fresh out of high school and straight off to college in New Jersey. I was nervous, excited, lonely, broke, and everything else a girl from a low income inner city feels. As it often goes, I tried my fill of things to satisfy my feelings of discontentment. I smoked a little weed, but didn't like the feeling of not being in control. I drank a little, but that felt awful. I cried a lot. I was lost. Then I met a tall, thin, older upperclassman. Let's call him John. I knew I wasn't his type. I was barely 18, unconfident, and he was the president of the Black Student Union. Hey, I'm John. You must be an incoming freshman. Oh, uh, hi. Yeah, I'm I'm new here in town. I mean, in in school. <laughs> well, welcome to town and school. Thanks. And what's your name? Etta. Well, come on then, little sister. I'll show you around. Uh, sure. Not long after hanging out with him, I was in love. I met his family, his mother, father, brother, and fiance. Yeah, he was engaged, but that didn't change my emotions. He was, in effect, my first love. Only it was a unilateral love. I loved him, and he liked me a little. Our time together became more frequent. John would invite me to his room for a friendly game of cards, leaving me a little note on my dry erase board outside my dorm room. The card games became more intense with the wager being a piece of clothing. Two pairs. Read them and weep. I win. Ah, good job. I'm finally getting better at this. You sure are. How about for this next game, let's wager something different. Okay, what are we going to wager? Hmm. If you lose this next hand, you have to take off your shirt. <laughs> my shirt? Yeah, and if I lose, I have to take off my shirt. I don't know, John. Come on, it'll be fun. You said you're getting better, so you probably won't even lose. <sighs> okay. I was officially in the middle of a scandalous affair by my sophomore year of college. I was so in love, continuing to be his little secret instead of his little sister. I was going to his home with him and his fiance. Only my nights continued after she went home. Good night, sweetheart. I'll call you in the morning. Well, I should probably go home too. Why? It's still early. I have class in the morning. Oh, come on. How about you just stay here for the night? Your fiancé just left. Exactly. But you're still here. Just stay for the night. <sighs> okay. The affair was short-lived as folks started to notice all the extra time we spent together. The news eventually got back to his fiancé and she started trying different tactics to confront me. She stalked me and knocked on my door, but I would never answer. She even tried pulling the fire alarm to catch me as I exited the building. I was so scared that I started staying in a friend's room. I was even too scared to go to the cafeteria so people would bring me food. One night, she finally caught me. I was in my friend's room when she knocked then burst through the door, punched me in the mouth, grabbed me and pushed me around until I ran away and escaped. 
Afterwards, John stopped speaking to me. Better put, he stopped acknowledging my existence on the planet Earth. Hello? Hey, John. It's Etta. Um, why did you completely ignore me today at the student union? John? Hello? John? I was devastated. I was depressed. It would begin my second trip down suicide attempt lane. After my first attempt as a teenager, my mom told me that if I killed myself, I would go straight to hell because I couldn't repent. That statement prevented many suicide attempts as I grew up. This time, though, it would be symbolic. This time, I wouldn't try to actually kill myself, just do enough for someone, anyone, to notice my pain. I collected pills from different people I knew who took drugs and swallowed a bunch at a time. But there was no resolution, and no one cared. According to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in 2020, there was sadly a suicide every 11 minutes. It's unsettling, but suicide is a leading cause of death. In the U.S., anyone needing help with thoughts of suicide can call or text 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Services are free and confidential. Not long after my symbolic suicide attempt, I decided I would drop out of college and join the Air Force. I drove back to my hometown and made an appointment with the local recruiting office. I took the required test to get in and I passed it with flying colors. I was usually good at taking tests. I was well on my way to joining and I even had my date to be sworn in. At the last moment though, I decided against it. I wanted to take another shot at my college experience. What could go wrong this time? I soon found out. An acquaintance began inviting me to Bible study. I said yes a few times, but always found an excuse not to go. Eventually, I did go. A caravan of people from a church in New Jersey came and explained God's plan in a way that touched my soul like never before. Let's call the leader of the church, Jason. I am Brother Jason, and we are members of an incredible church a church unlike any other. We know and speak the true word of God. If you commit one sin, you will lose your salvation. God sacrificed his only son, Jesus Christ, to save all of mankind. He made the ultimate sacrifice for you. Who here is ready to give their life over to Christ? Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready to give my life to Christ. Praise God. It was a Friday night that I will never forget. The Bible study started at 7 p.m. and ended at 10 p.m. I was so convicted of sin and so ready to give my life to Christ. I got saved that night. The service ended with the minister leading us all in a song, This Train is a Clean Train. I know it is said that salvation is a process, but for me, life changed dramatically that night. Old things were passed away, and I was indeed a new creature. Everything about me changed right away. The same happened for a number of people on campus. God was on the move in a mighty way. My entire concept of honesty also changed completely. In the past, I had taken a test in one of my classes where I cheated. I was sitting near the professor during the test and I noticed her answer sheet, so I changed one of my test answers. After the transformation, I went back to the professor. <sighs> professor Roberts, I have a confession to make. I cheated on the test last month. I'm so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. Now I'm a completely different person. I'm trying to be honest in every part of my life. My professor started crying too. 
I would have never thought about making that confession before being saved. We had Bible study every Friday night and people were getting saved, lives were being changed. We preached, sang, passed out pamphlets featuring biblical literature, and enjoyed our new lives. I completely changed from the trendy, mainstream girl that I was in the past. The way the ladies and I dressed changed dramatically too. We went from wearing shorts, mini skirts, and tight attire to loosely fitting long skirts. Makeup became minimal or not present at all. We now only listen to gospel music, no more R&B. Most pronounced was our belief regarding sin. Just one sin, any sin, will cause you to lose your salvation. Salvation is free, but it ain't cheap to keep. We believe that with all our hearts and tried to live sin-free lives. A lot of people were offended, alienated, and just plain turned off by our stance, but we continued. There were whispers of us being a cult because of how sudden and dramatic the changes were. But our numbers still grew. It's unfortunate, but cults often use college campuses for recruitment. Back in the 1980s, a journal from the U.S. Department of Justice reported cults which are sometimes masked as respectable religious groups, recruit heavily on college campuses. They harm students by disrupting their education, careers, friendships, and family ties. More recently, in 2022, Yale News reported a Christian group faced criticism for functioning like a cult on their campus. Bible study on campus was now Wednesday night in addition to Friday night. I loved interpreting scripture so much that I earned the nickname Scripture Girl. Our church leader, Brother Jason, began to take notice of my zeal. I can feel your passion for scriptures. The members tell me that you've earned the name Scripture Girl. Praise God, yes, I devour the scriptures. What do you love about the scriptures? Hmm, I love to break them down and discover different cross-references in the teachings. Well, that is fantastic. The Lord loves those that explain his powerful word. And I'm always looking for truly devoted young ladies like you. As our church leader, everyone took notice of Jason, and Jason took notice of all the young ladies. Jason was married to Candace, but one young lady, Crystal, always drove his van, always arrived with him, dressed like him, and even wore a wedding band just like his. He seemed really close to Crystal. It was at Bible study where we were discussing Christianity and other cultures that I finally figured it out. Let me ask you all a question. Salvation can be different all around the world, can it not? Did you know that in other countries polygamy is allowed in Christian religions? What if I lived in a different country and practiced polygamy? Would that make me any less faithful? Would my utter devotion to God be any less? Of course not. Of course not. So Crystal was one of his wives. As I would soon learn, so were other girls and the more mature women in the church. I never let on to my suspicions, but I think Jason knew that I knew more than I let on. It wasn't long after his discussion about polygamy that Jason started giving me more attention. Scripture girl, I'm going to allow you to start driving me in my van. Yes, that sounds great, Brother Jason. Hmm. I'm also going to start giving you one-on-one Bible studies at my home. I think you deserve my special attention. Thank you. I would love that. I really want to learn about the Word of God from you as much as possible. After more time passed, during a telephone conversation, Jason told me that God had revealed to him that I was to be one of his concubines. Hello? Scripture Girl, how are you on this wonderful day? Hi, Brother Jason. I have very good news for you. God has revealed something great to me. Okay. God has revealed that you will be one of my concubines. Oh. 
Well, aren't you excited and joyous about this? Um, I don't know. Listen, you know the scriptures better than anyone else. David was said to be positioned as one above the law because of his heart's devotion to God. And as you know, King David was given certain privileges because of his heart. As I am your leader, am I not afforded those same privileges as King David? Uh, well, I suppose that makes sense. Of course it does. You understand scriptures better than most. I will call upon you when the time is right. Jason represented King David. This was the rationalization I chose to live with. I was so afraid and I didn't want to fail a test from God. We put all our confidence in Jason, his connection to God, and his ability to teach us. On my 19th birthday, he called me. Hello? Hello? Hi, Brother Jason. It's time. You will meet me tonight. Yes, Brother Jason. Happy birthday. I met him at his job in the parking lot. That's where we consummated our marriage. Our once godly relationship was now marred by sex and my life was forever changed. I continued to study, pray, fast, and do the things that would develop my relationship with God. But I was also obsessed with Jason. So were many others. Quickly, jealousy, lies, and deceit were the undertone in most of our Bible studies. During study, girls would all try to get the best seat closest to Jason. We would compete to look more spiritual than the other to earn more respect from him. This is because whoever was number one with Jason was given the opportunity to spend the most time with him. We also all started lavishing Jason with gifts to try and earn his favor. He loved cappuccino, so someone was always bringing him a cup of his favorite drink. We would bring him fresh fruit, incense, and other gifts. I even bought him a tabletop Pac-Man machine. Brother Jason, I got this for you. Ah, this is a great gift. Thank you. You're welcome. God rewards generosity. At this point, Jason's sexual relations with me and his other concubines was becoming more frequent. Outside of Wednesday and Friday night Bible study, during Sunday church services, Jason would pull out women for sex. Thank you all for attending our church services today. I'm going to let Minister Kevin take over from here as I work on private Bible study. Sister Edda, could you please follow me? Yes, Brother Jason. I do need to add that most of the congregation was not aware of what was going on. Only those involved knew of the horrible, ungodly acts that were happening right under their noses. After a couple of years, though, things began to get sloppy. Jason got real comfortable with his harem of women, and others around were finally waking up. People started noticing how much more time he spent with the women in the church. Husbands were realizing that their actual wives were also Jason's wives. One couple that was instrumental in training and mentoring the new recruits got divorced after the husband discovered the truth about his wife. The man was made out to be a liar by the other church members, while his former wife remained with Jason and the church. There were more divorces and separations, and finally, the church split. Most of the church, many still unaware of the sex and deceit behind the split, went with Jason. We became a new church. There have been too many lies and too much betrayal in this church. Therefore, this church must split. Those who are truly faithful will come with me. Follow me to salvation in our new church. Follow me to God. There were probably about 50 members of the new church and around 15 concubines, not including Jason's actual wife. The new church grew rapidly, but at this point I was becoming irrational 
and constantly trying to call and speak with Jason. It's Etta. Is Jason there? Where is he? Oh, well, ask around and find out. I need to speak with him. Where's Jason? Where is Jason? I need to speak with him right now. Is he with another girl? Who is he with? Hello? I was jealous of his other concubines, and my bitterness started to affect my standing in the church, especially when we were split into groups based on our weaknesses and our potential for growth. The two groups that you will be separated into are the elite and the fired up. The elite are my right-hand followers who have been with this church from the start. The fired up have potential. Scripture girl, you will be part of the fired up group. But Brother Jason, why? Why wouldn't I be a part of the elite group? Why? Because of your jealousy and bitterness. You are not ready to be in the elite group. We all wanted to be elite. We all wanted to sit under Jason's feet. We all wanted the knowledge that he had to offer. For Bible study, we met in different houses. We had study in one room while Jason was having sex in the next room. The more mature women in the group, by more mature I mean in their 30s, orchestrated many of the encounters and were themselves involved with Jason. The mature women would call the younger women and set meetings with Jason. The younger women would then be instructed to meet Jason at some specific place and time. As more women were being brought into Jason's harem, my jealousy heightened. Newer, younger ladies were taking over my position of power and attention. Jason stopped treating me like he cared about me anymore and gave his attention to these other women. I would think, why does he like her more than me? What's wrong with me? During one Bible study, I locked myself in the bathroom and cried and cried. I refused to leave for hours. I was too afraid to tell anyone the truth about what was wrong. At one point, I did try to speak with Jason's actual wife, Candace. She said I could trust her, but she was actually lying. She immediately informed Jason of anything I said. Even during all this sin, though, the church membership continued to expand and we started going to different colleges. We must continue to grow this church. We will go to colleges and universities throughout the state and even more universities outside the state. We expanded to Cornell, Yale, and MIT. New members included a math professor, many engineers with advanced degrees, and computer science tech professionals. So many intelligent people were joining us, but there was so much sin, so much deceit. We must continue to grow this church. Next are Indian reservations, and then we start traveling to other countries. We must spread my word as far and wide as possible. We traveled to Guadalupe, Antigua, and other countries. Lives were being changed. People were getting saved. But lives were also being destroyed. By now, I was so bitter, so sad, so hurt that I began to talk. I told a few people the truth about what was going on under their noses. That didn't work too well for me. I was made out to be insane. Some church members started proclaiming to others, she's telling lies and trying to cause division, or she's not mentally right. Stay away from her. Many people stopped speaking to me. This was especially difficult because the church members were my only contact. The members of this church are your new family. This is your blood family. You are bonded with them through the blood of Christ. 
Yes, Brother Jason. If you want to speak with your milk family, you must ask for permission. Yes, Brother Jason. When I did obtain permission to visit my milk family, those visits were usually awkward because I would condemn everyone to hell. Grandma, if you keep smoking, that's a sin and you're going straight to hell. And I know you love Martin Luther King, but he was an adulterer, so because of that sin, he's in hell too. One big element the cults force upon members is family separation. According to the Atlantic article, The Seven Signs That You're in a Cult, one of the signs involves isolating members and penalizing them for leaving. Basically, individuals who become trapped in cults are told to disown family members because their beliefs serve as distractions from the real way of following God. Severing contact with family members also makes it even more difficult to leave the cult. With the members of the church no longer speaking to me, and after losing touch with my real family, my last hope was to plead with the Lord. God, I have no joy. My commitment has been more focused on a man and not your unchanging word. I have put the creature before the creator. Where are you? I just want to serve you. Why are you allowing this to happen? I know your promises. Are they meant for me? <laughs> Please, Lord, just let me die. Please, let me die. Let me die. My urgent pleas for death were constant because I certainly would not try suicide again. I had become pathetic. I have now come to realize that death is not my call to make. I will live. I will fulfill my destiny until God says it's all over. But back then, I was lost and controlled. You will wear what we tell you to wear. Yes, Brother Jason. And from now on, Bible study will be every night for four hours as well as Sunday church. Yes, Brother Jason. You must attend every Bible study. Yes, Brother Jason. Mind you, in the midst of this, our studies and our preachings was Christ. We went to churches, preached, sang, put on plays, and spread the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. We sang about the joy of the Lord, but I had no joy. I had my own apartment that was paid for from working, but it was still run by the church. I was working as an insurance statistician, so I was making some money, but I was spending it all on the church. My apartment was used for Bible study whenever needed. I was also told that church members would live in my apartment for different periods of time while I paid for the food and rent. I was never a fan of anyone living in my house. I went to work while they hung out, probably with Jason. Bills came and they were paid by me. I felt terribly used, but I was afraid to speak up. I didn't want to be labeled as selfish. I, along with everyone else, was controlled by Jason and the church. I eventually reached my boiling point. I could no longer stand it. I stopped going to Bible study. This was a major offense. It was late one night. A few people came to my house. They said that Jason wanted me at study. I went, and to my surprise, the study focused on me. Tonight's Bible study will be focused on trust and the lack of trust from you. Me? Yes. Abraham received a command from God to circumcise the males in his camp. This ordinance, done as a covenant before God, required those men to have trust in Abraham's connection with God. You must trust me, as Abraham was trusted. The group formed a circle around me. As a show of trust in me, everyone is going to get their nostrils slashed with a butcher knife. You, scripture girl, will be first. Place the knife in her nose. No, please. I don't want to do this. <gasps> she has no trust. 
Where is your faith in me, scripture girl? I am the most connected to God. If certain members were here right now, you would be killed for your lack of trust. Please stop. I, I can't take this anymore. This isn't right. I had to wake up from this nightmare. After nine long years, I finally concluded that I had to go. I had to escape this church and Jason and all the lies. One of my last hopes was asking a co-worker at my insurance job for help. I hadn't known her for a long time, but we had become friends while working together. I found the courage to tell her some of what was going on in my life. My co-worker was completely shocked. I needed money to move somewhere, anywhere. My brother was an up and coming musician, so money was no issue for him. My coworker suggested a city and I was ready to go. I gave her my brother's number and told her to lie to him about how she got it. Soon after, my brother called me and told me to meet him at a recording studio. When I got there, he gave me a check and said he thought I could use some extra money. We never discussed what was actually going on in my life. With my brother's help, I got in my car and moved far away from the church. I finally escaped. I was finally free, off to a fresh start where no one would ever control me again. The fresh start wasn't easy though. I'm in a new city with no friends. At this point, I'm in my late 20s and have never been in a committed relationship. There was just Jason. I met a few guys, but I was socially awkward and no one ever won anything but something secret and temporary. I miss most of the experiences that young ladies have growing up. For my new life, I also decided definitely no more church for me. I knew that what I experienced was not a normal church, but I didn't want to take any more chances Plus, I felt like I was owed my youth back. I was sure that God would understand. I wanted some type of normalcy in my life. Worst of all my problems though, my brother was sick, real sick. By now he was a famous musician, but to me, he was just my brother. He loved me so much. Every time he saw me, he hugged me like he was never going to see me again. I guess that's because he knew how sick he was. He loved me and he thought I was special, even if I was weird. Then he died. Part of me died too. I've never been the same. I look at old pictures and the light that used to be in my eyes is gone. Maybe he took it with him. I would have never escaped the church without his help and I was at least able to spend time with him during his final years. If I were still trapped in the cult, I probably wouldn't have seen him at all. I grew into adulthood in a cult. It was indeed a cult. The most life-changing, greatest event that could ever happen to me, being saved, became a living nightmare. At the time, I didn't know where else to go. I didn't know what else to do. I wasn't held in physical bonds, but in mental and spiritual bonds. But believe it or not, I don't regret it. Being trapped in the cult actually helped give me the tenacity to fight. And most importantly, no matter what, I was saved. I established my personal relationship with God that I still have to this day. And no one can ever take that away. Allegedly is a production of Voyage Media. The series is produced by Nat Mundell, Robert Midas, and Dan Benamore. This episode, You've Gotta Hurt Before You Heal, was written, directed, and produced by Jason Cheney, based on Etta Cole's novel, You've Gotta Hurt Before You Heal, available on Amazon. A link is in the show notes. Starring T. Siobhan Stewart and Kareem Ferguson. Editing and sound design by Thomas Culleton. Original music by Derlis Gonzalez. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a five-star review in Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you're listening, and subscribe now for future episodes.